Welcome to the Michael Artsis Show. I'm Michael Artsis. Thanks so much for joining us. You're the Terrifics. You make Be Terrific special. You can reach us on all social media at Be Terrific TV. And of course, you can join our Slack chat to keep the conversation going in real time, 24 hours a day. Join us, the rest of the Terrifics, and you, beterrific.com slash Slack. Give us your name, your email address. We'll send you an invitation when we do the show. We'll read your comments and questions on air sometimes and even sneak them to our guests as well. Speaking of guests, I've got a great guest today. Kevin J. Anderson is joining us. His new book is Clockwork Lives. The book is so awesome that not only did I take one look at it and buy it immediately, but, but, but I bought the real book, not a digital copy, not for my Kindle, not for my iPad. I bought a real book. Two reasons. One, it's gorgeous and I have to have it and I want to put it on my desk after I read it. But not only that, it's a real beautiful book and Kevin's going to show it to us, but I can show Jack one day, my son, this is a real book. Because trust me, there won't be books when he's old enough to read. He's only two. Uh, Kevin, uh, thanks so much for joining us. The book is gorgeous. Can you show it off to everybody first? Sure, Let's just get I that can. out of the way. Look at that thing. Clockwork Lives and it is gorgeous. It's like leather bound, is it not? It, it's like a leatherette. And look at we got end papers. It's got beautiful, well, there, there's color printing. There's I don't know if we're gonna find one because I'm on the spot here. But there's there's illustrations in it. There we go. Here's see that there's line art illustrations through it. Um, it's just beautiful design in it. Color printing, the kind of stuff that you want to hold and uh, cherish. Now I I myself I like reading a physical book when I'm sitting down. But I travel a lot, so I put it on my my. I have a Kobo, mm -hmm. but I have a Kindle as well, and and I like doing that. But there are some books that this is what books were for, the, the experience of just you know smelling the paper and, and seeing how beautiful it is. Now, I did my best to make the story inside worth reading no matter what format you've got. But ECW Press, who is the publisher on it, and they also did my, my previous book in the series, Clockwork Angels, uh, it is, this is what you want to show off to your son. This is what books used to look like. So yeah. it's not one of those you buy it and read it on a plane and then throw it out. So, you, you talk so. about the smell of the book. It's funny. Um, I, there's a smell to an ice hockey rink, and it's very. It's not similar to the smell of a baseball field, but it, you know that scene in Field of Dreams where he he says, "Oh, the smell of the grass and all that." And 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 we recently were in a ice hockey rink, and I'm a hockey guy, and 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 you get the same kind of feeling when you're on a baseball field. But when I'm in a hockey rink, I, I walked in with Greg, and I took one smell of of that rink and the cold air rushed and, and, and I just got this rush over me and I'm like, hockey. And it's the, I think you're right though, there is an experience to reading a book, the smell, the feel, the touch, especially a leather covered book that we forget about today. And I'm not a big like, I don't want to have a book, but when it's something special like this I do and I want to experience that. So I think it's really awesome. I think it's great that the publisher not only let you go with it, put, pushed you in that direction, and that you have it today. Again, you can take it with you. You can read it on a Kindle. You can read it on an iPad. But you can also get the experience, which doesn't exist in books anymore. And I think that's part of the reason why people are going back to vinyl for music a lot now and so popular. It's because it's the experience around it. I used to tell people I love going out to dinner. It's not about going out and eating. It's about the actual experience of having the meal and being with people. Well, and even a more obvious thing that we all watch movies and TV, and there's there are a few movies a year that I feel like I want to go to a movie theater to see the whole thing. I mean, you don't want to watch Avatar on your iPhone. You got to be in the theater. You got to have the whole experience of it. Um, my wife and I just went out to see the new Mission Impossible movie. That was just in the big screen, watching all the action going on. There are lots of things that is perfectly fine to watch on my my TV, and of course I've got a pretty decent sized TV, so it's fine. But the experience of seeing a, a movie on the big screen, I mean, you, you can bet when Star Wars number seven comes out, I'm not gonna wait for it to be on video to watch on to my TV. And, and you know, well, Clockwork Lives is the, is the big screen movie version of a book. You, wanna, you want to have this one. Yeah, the, I- The story's good too, I mean, I, I should mention that. <laughs> There's a bunch of random words in it, but it looks really pretty. It, it's a good story. Tell us, I'll tell you what, tell us about the story. Okay, um, I'm gonna step back because I told you that they published the earlier version. I, I will show, I love these these video Skypes instead of the audio ones because if I do this on an audio Skype, it doesn't do any good at all. Uh, this is Clockwork Lives. 
it was um, written with Neil Peart, the drummer from the rock band Rush, and it is based. It's the novel based on their concept album. Their last album that came out was called Clockwork Angels, with a story all the way through it. And uh, Neil, who wrote all the lyrics for the songs, worked with me to do the novel of it. ECW published it. Beautiful book, just like Clockwork Lives. It's full of full color artwork by the painted by the guy who does all the Rush album covers. Um, beautiful story. It was a New York Times bestseller. We got all the lyrics for the songs in it. Uh, Rush was on a tour for two years for this album, so we sold a lot of books, and, and people have been reading this story. And that was three years ago when it came out. And it, it kind of shook people up because there, people don't write novels based on an album. And there's not every album that you can do that with. Um, you don't really see the epic novel about Justin Bieber's greatest hits or something like that. Rush has a big story, a big concept through it, and Neil and I worked on it to come up with this world and the character and everything with it. But as we were writing it, we kept getting ideas for another plot that we could follow, or this, this side character was really interesting, and we just sort of put those in our mental manila folder. These were things that we wanted to think about at some other time. And three years went by and Rush was on tour for years and I was writing a Dune book and a Seven Sons book and a Dan Shamble zombie PI novels and, and a you, bunch of other things. You, you, you are amazing. You always have so many projects going on um, and, and I'm just looking through. You could be on every week talking about a different book. Um, yeah, but then I'd have no time to write. That's true. I, I'll always come back to you, Michael. Uh, and so these, as the couple of years went by, these these characters just kept like hanging out and bugging me. They kept saying, "Pay attention, will you come come back to this story?" And and the world, this steampunk fantasy world with with pirates and airships and the Watchmaker and lost cities and a steampunk carnival. It was all just this. I spent so much time building this world that I wanted to to explore it again. And we had all these little tales of like the bookseller's tale and the airship captain's tale and and the alchemy miner's tale but i didn't really want just a book full of short stories i mean about the idea was kind of a steampunk canterbury tales but canterbury tales has a story through it there's a reason why all these stories came together and for clockwork lives we worked and we thought about it and and finally we came up with with just like the coolest idea for this story to bind it together and and I will tell you so it'll be it's not really a spoiler because it all the first couple of chapters but we got a woman whose name is Marinda Peak she lives in this small town it's a quiet perfect life in this steampunk uh, turn of the century world and she doesn't want to adventure she doesn't want to do anything else she just wants to have her her home and she gave up the man she loved to, and she wanted to marry she gave up her career she gave up everything because her father is sick and she has to take care of him and she's tending him for years and she basically let life pass her by. Then when she di when he dies, the first words in his will are, at first you will hate me for this and then you'll love me for it. He cuts her out of her entire inheritance and only gives her a book, a wow. blank book that she has to go fill with the stories of other people who had lives that she didn't have. And until she fills this book, she can't go back home. And it's a magical book. It's an alchemical book that if she gets a drop of blood from somebody and drops it onto the page, then it spills out their whole life story. Wow. That's where the tales come through. But she has her own story. She's going around the world. She meets up with the pirates, and she falls in love with the with the fisherman and she explores the alchemy mines and she goes to the lost cities and she has her own story and she's somebody who never wanted to adventure so she has to grow and, and ex explore everything as her own character and it all ties together and out of the I've published close to 130 books and this really is one of my very favorites out of all of them Wow that's very cool I'm looking forward to checking it out. It's really, really exciting to me. Um, did you write this like you normally write? You live in Colorado, you take a walk and you record it into a uh, audio recorder and then you uh, say, here, transcribe this to somebody. That, is that how you wrote this? That's exactly how I did it. The, uh, it even worked more interesting than that because, like I said, this has just been on my back burner for a couple of years. And Neil and I talked about it 
but we didn't have any really big plans. And it just so happened that I had finished this this gangbusters writing of a book called Blood of the Cosmos, this 800-page manuscript that uh, that's the book we were talking about the last time I was on a, a month or two ago. Yeah. Um, I had finished writing that book, and my brain was empty. I mean, I crashed through writing 800 pages in, in a few months. And so I just went out into the mountains. I threw the tent and the sleeping bag in the back of my truck, drove out to this national forest with some trails I wanted to hike, and I just wasn't going to do anything. I was going to just recuperate. But I always carry my recorder with me just in case I want to say, you know, remember to buy shaving cream on the way home or something like that. <laughs> So I was hiking the canyon and a waterfall and surrounded by trees, and I was just like absorbing all the beautiful stuff and thinking of things. And I got like this lightning bolt of, oh, here's the character that I wanted to think about. And I started thinking, and I, I came up with the entire uh, Steamliner pilot story. And I went, that's great. I want to work on this. And then, oh, let me do the fortune teller story. And they are just all like, I had been waiting for so long that it all just kind of popped like popcorn and I'm dictating it turned out that I, I dictated 40 pages of just notes on that one hike. Wow. And That's... then I came home and had them all transcribed. I thought I'm going to surprise Neil Peart with these. I'm going to write them all up and then say, look, I'm working on the book. But then before they even came back from being typed, uh, my brother-in-law and I went off on this other really epic hike in Colorado, a 23 mile long loop hike. And I wasn't writing anything. I didn't have a book I was working on. So I thought, well, what the heck, I'll take my, my recorder with me. And on 23 miles worth of hiking, I just went, well, let me just write the first chapter. And then I'll write the second chapter. And it turned out I wrote like the first four or five chapters on this hike. That's amazing. So I got them all typed up. But I, I mean, Neil Peart knew we were going to do something eventually, but he didn't know I was starting. So I sort of mailed him the first 60 pages and said, surprise. That's really, really awesome. Now, I loved it, and it was fun. Um, how long does it take you to hike 23 miles? An hour. That's it? No. It took me, that was probably like a 12-hour hike. I don't know why I bought that. I was like, an hour, what? No, I, I thought you were going to say a day. Good. How oh, Wait, how long, 12 hours? Long, thought, really? It's, no, 23 miles. I think we we got up probably at, at 4.30 or 5 in the morning, got to the trailhead around 7, and got back to the car maybe 7 30 or 8 o'clock at night wow so 12 hours i think it would take me days to do that that's why i thought you were saying one day you did it in 12 hours that's impressive that's um, I, i've got questions for you in the slack chat from our uh, sure. very amazing terrifics we got to take a quick break though when we come back we'll have more with kevin j anderson we're going to talk about woodfire press wordfire press I think I said wood fire last time too. Uh, that's because I like the wood fire pizza, and my friend keeps telling me I gotta come to his place in San Francisco and have wood fire pizza in his backyard. But it's wor <laughs> wordfirepress.com. We're gonna talk more with you. I'll get to the uh, viewer questions, the terrific questions when we get back. You're you're such an exciting guy, and I will tell you this, I have told so many people how impressed I am with how you write and the uh, taking the recorder and everything like that. I, I literally have told 35 people since you were on, you won't believe this. This guy, this is how he writes. And if I ever write a book, that's how I'm going to write a book. I don't think I have a book in me. I kind of do, but I don't know. But, but you're awesome, and you're a lot of fun, and the stories are amazing. And you've lived such a great life, been able to do so many things, writing books, collaborating with music. You're writing on series that are unbelievable. You've done some really amazing projects, and of course, this new one is unbelievable. And it should be on the New York Times bestseller list now, right? You've sold more than enough to, to make it. Well, I hope so. If all your viewers buy our list, then, then, we'll, then we'll make it. No That's problem. what we need. We need all the Terrifics to buy the book. And uh, we'll tell you more about it when we come back. We'll talk more with Kevin J. Anderson right after this. Don't go anywhere. Stay with us. This is the Michael Arts Show. You're the Terrifics. You make me terrific special. Rode microphones are the official microphones of Be Terrific. Find out more at roadmic.com. Welcome back to your 
Michael Arts' show coverage. I don't know why I said that. I was thinking of Comic-Con. I was talking to Kevin J. Anderson in the break about all the Comic-Cons he's going to, and I was like, getting in the mood for Comic-Con, because we're doing New York Comic-Con, as you know. October 8th to 11th. It's going to be live continuing coverage, and that's going to be exciting. Uh, Andrea is going to be joining us to co-host the coverage and the festivities, and we're also going to have two sets, one on the main floor and one in the hallway. The second set will be in the Project Triforce booth, and that's going to be amazing. And we're going to introduce you guys to Andrea uh, in uh, the next few days. I think next week she's going to come on uh, via Skype. She's from Los Angeles, but you guys are going to love her. She's amazing. Andrea Fasano. All right, I've got Kevin J. Anderson here joining us via Skype from Colorado, and he is talking to us about all sorts of cool stuff, writing, his new book, it's unbelievable, and I've got a lot of questions in the Slack chat that I have to get to. So I guess uh, the first one, well, first of all, thank you for joining us, and, and, welcome. and welcome. Uh, show the book again. Mm -hmm. uh, you should always show the book, Clockwork Lives. It's, we'll it's, just keep this up. You know how it's going to be, first of all, it's a gorgeous book. I should mention again, I bought this book when you showed it to me. First of all, I get a lot of books sent to me. I don't usually buy books, and the books I buy I buy digitally because I don't. I'm a germaphobe. I don't like paper and all that stuff. But this is. I need the experience, and it's a beautiful book. I I didn't even wait for like, hey, we'll send you a copy. I bought one. I wanted to support you. I, you come on the show a lot, and I like that. And you're awesome. So, and it's a great book, and I want to be able to show my son Jack. You know. I appreciate it. So I want the viewers to know, like, that's how cool I think this book is. I, I think everybody's gotta gotta get it. You gotta check it out and um, help you get on the New York Times bestseller list for sure. Uh, wordfirepress.com to find out more, by the way. You mentioned, before I get to the viewers, I wanted to ask you something. You mentioned the Kobo before. Um, what about the Kobo? Do you like it? Why do you have a Kobo? Um, because I've thought about the Kobo when it first came out, and then I was like, ah, Kindle's better, I think, and then an iPad. That's the answer. Well, I had a, I had a Kindle when they first came out. In fact, I've had probably three Kindles. Um, every there is a point to this answer. Um, every year I have a big writer's workshop that I run called the Superstars Writing Seminars. And um, it teaches the business of writing and the publishing industry and building your career. And one of our guest speakers for year after year is the guy who runs Kobo, uh, the Kobo Writing Life for all authors to put up their own stuff, just like on Kindle, you can put a Kindle desktop publishing. And he's been so supportive of our stuff. And he, he gave me a Kindle to play around with and to, to use and you know it's I, I take it with me I've kind of fallen in love with it so I enjoy the Kobo a lot um, but to me it's it's to me it's the words I mean I'm, I'm the writer so I want you to read the words and I don't really care so much about the vehicle that you get the words um, Kobo is the biggest one in Canada and of course Clockwork Lives is co-authored with the drummer from Rush and Rush is from Canada so there's the whole Canadian connection there but you know, I I enjoy using my Kobo. I I I have not really played with a Nook. I'm I'm not really advertising any specific one. But I personally have a Kobo that I use. Cool. You like it? I like it. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Janny wanted to know what it was like co-authoring a book with a musician, especially because musicians are a lot of times uh, they're very much artistic and they always have these unusual concepts, especially when you talk music videos with them. And so Janny's watching in Finland, and he's like, hey, what's it like writing a book with a guy who's really a, a musician but probably is way out there with his conceptual ideas and creativity? Well, but Neil is a very literate and literary person. He reads books all the time. He's, he's read lots and lots of my books. And he had, this, he had the idea and the visuals for this story, the, the Clockwork Carnival and the Anarchist and the Watchmaker and the Seven Cities of Gold. And he had all these things in his head and he was describing them to me and we were talking about the characters but we were brainstorming we we you'll get a kick out of this the way we plotted our our first one clockwork angels which i get to show up <laughs> i love video skype um so clockwork angels we in between two of his concert gigs and i'm living in colorado and he was playing uh, at the red rocks uh amphitheater in denver and i took him up we climbed a fourteen thousand foot mountain on his day off because that's what you do when you're on your day off and you're a rock drummer and you're with a science fiction writer. So I took him up on a 14,000 foot mountain, we climbed it, and the whole time we were just brainstorming this story. And he had he had the songs that he was writing for the album and he knew the, the different 
events in this character's story, but I was trying to put all the connecting tissue in. So how do we get from this event to this event? And it was a very um, exciting, brainstorming, imaginative experience. And um, it was great to work with. So uh, I've known Neil for 27 years, so we were already good friends. This wasn't a strangers trying to figure something out. And it just was a great exhilarating experience. And I told you a little in the previous segment about how Clockwork Lives came about. And we, I would be sending him pieces and notes and telling him, here's the outline and here's what I plan to do. And, and he would put feedback back to me. And, and it turned out to be a very exhilarating experience. First of all, I always thought musicians on their days off went shopping with beautiful women, whatever city they were in. Uh, I didn't think they, that's that's my fantasy of what it is to be a rock star. Well, Rush is probably an anomaly of, of many different things. But I mean, you went hiking fourteen thousand feet up a mountain. Why that's, not? I don't know. Well, you're such an outdoors guy. You're like, yeah, I just go for a walk every day. Well, I don't know. That's so foreign to me. I get well, in the car Neil and I drive. Neil is a pretty athletic guy himself too. I it's mean, I'm athletic, but I got one of those skateboards to ride around. I don't want to. I'm not a wilderness guy. That's what it is. It no, sounds probably. amazing. So we're out we're climbing and we're, we're going up. We climb over a ridge and, and Neil's talking and I, I came up first climbing up over some rocks and I turned around to him and I, I just like quick put up my hand like this because right when we came out there were like three Rocky Mountain uh, sheep just right there next to us. And of course they ran as soon as they saw us. But these are, you gotta have experiences or you don't have anything in your, in your creative Library. No, it's very true, and, and it's very creative. I like it a lot. Um, what about uh, Digital Phil wanted to know, you know, what's it like getting notes from him? Because it, when is he writing the notes? Because it seems like all they do is, is perform and sleep and perform and, and sleep. And, and so when is he finding time to write you notes, and, and, and what, what are the, how are those notes given to you? Well, i got to tell you, this is, we also, for Clockwork Angels, we converted it to a graphic novel, which was six like comic book issues that they then gathered in into a, a trade paperback book. So each of those six issues was a 22-page script. Okay, so I would write the script in script format and email them to Neil, saying, "Okay, read this and figure out if you want me to add anything or change it." These were six issues, one per month. Each time every one of those scripts I would email it to him at any time of the day and within one hour he would respond back to me with his can you add this or how about this extra panel or change this dialogue and it was like within an hour every single time I sent it to him he would read it and make his comments Wow that's you know and what with, that, you know what that is that's dedication and desire because I know a lot of athletes a lot of celebrities when they want to do something, when they're really motivated, they're on top of it. And, and that's a situation where the guy really wants to do it. Well, and he just really had fun. We, when I wrote Clockwork Angels, and this is, this is scary to me because Neil's like a big idol of mine. He's inspired me since I was in high school. And, and just the fact that, that we're friends and partners has been like sometimes hard to believe. But when I was writing Clockwork Angels, I would write a chapter or two a day and I would send him that immediate rough draft. As soon as it came back from the typist, I would send it to him. Like every day he got his draft chapters and then he would make his comments every day that I would get his, his suggested changes or additions. And he would often add things, um, add this character, or let's add, let's expand this some. And this was like an everyday creative process. And now that it's been a few years after that happened, I, I sit back maybe a little bit in horror going, I sent Neil my roughest rough draft I should have cleaned it up first and I was gonna say like it's funny we've done video production uh, in the past we had a video production company and I would never send a client a, a rough cut I would always it would really be the finished version minus graphics and a couple of like minor things because they didn't have the vision they wouldn't be able to see where it could go obviously he's artistic it's a different thing but still I would I'm surprised you did that I would have thought you would have polished it a little more what were his notes like was he was he very positive and complimentary I love this but what do you think about this idea I'm really into this or was he like hey man we got to clean this up we got to do this we got to do that this sucks what are you thinking no it was it was mainly the first thing you said because it was he was very clear that that I was the writer guy and he was putting his ideas and his whole vision into it so he wasn't 
he got it that I was going to be polishing it and cleaning it up, that he was looking at the content rather than, you know, spelling mistakes and sloppy sentences and redundant stuff. And there was plenty of that in there. <laughs> but, so it was, but, but it was, it was intimidating because for anybody who, who knows the work of Neil Peart, this guy is absolutely a perfectionist. He's everything has got to be just the way he wants it. And he works and slaves to get it that way. So for me to be, you know, it's intimidating because if I was going to write something, what if, what if he turned out to be this, this nightmare collaborator, this impossible person to work with, and he wasn't that way at all? Well, uh, I could imagine that that would be a problem uh, and an issue, but as you talk about somebody being amazing and a professional and a perfectionist, I can only imagine him in the studio and how hard he would be working. Uh, I've seen guys in the studio and how hard they work, but it's also probably about the shows and how he pulls it off. So many people love Rush and it's their favorite band. Ray Choquette, who is G Wiz's dad, G Wiz being Greg Choquette, our producer here on the Michael Arts' show, his favorite band is Rush and he loves Neil. He, he is like the biggest Neil fan, and I think it's because of his chase of perfection because he talks about how everything sounds perfect and how every album flows together and how everything is put together so well. And he just wanted to know, did you get to see some of the precision that he has in the studio actually come out in the way you work together, and did you ever have phone calls, or was it all just sending notes? Well, I mean, we'd meet a couple of times a year when they were on tour and I would go and see them and we would hang out and have dinner beforehand or stuff or mostly because our schedules were kind of off because I'm here in Colorado and who knows what city he was in when they were touring. Um, email was what worked best, but there were there were times I'd get seven, eight emails a day from him with with comments on this or ideas back and forth. And there's a lot of stuff about alchemy in Clockwork Angels and Clockwork Lives that it's a steampunk world where alchemy works. So the watchmaker can create gold and there's like this free energy source called cold fire that, that everything runs on. And Neil was kind of getting getting off on his own tangent of studying alchemy and we could put this thing in and there are alchemical symbols throughout that, that sort of mean something here and there. And we kind of each did our own thing that we were best at and I've just as I've said many times, that I'm I'm so pleased with these books that I I write a lot of books and I'm I'm I never turn in anything that I don't think is is as good as I can possibly make it. But these two books are are something special in that that everything came out exactly the way I want it to be. Like you finish it and you go, yeah, that worked. Everything just fit together right. Uh, it's, that sounds amazing. I love when that happens. It's, it's just perfect. It, it's great. Um, we're going to take a quick break. We've got to get to some more of our Terrifics questions when we come back. Also, we've got to know uh, what events you're going to be at soon, like which Comic Cons, so we can promote that as well. And people can go visit you and say hello. We also have a couple of viewers who have some interesting uh, questions. And then, um, of course, I, I want to know, um, you know quickly about um, the, the best way to reach you. Is there a fan club, stuff like that, and, and what the future holds? So we're going to get all that and a whole lot more with Kevin J. Anderson when we come back right after this. Rode microphones are the official microphones of Be Terrific. Find out more at roadmike.com. Welcome back to the Michael Arts' Show. I'm Michael Arts. You're the Terrific, so you make Be Terrific special. Thanks so much for joining us at Be Terrific TV on all social media. I've got Kevin J. Anderson joining us via Skype. Amazing guy. I've got some questions i got to get to from the Terrifics. So this one is from, uh, um, this one's from Jay Bird. And Jay Bird wants to know, how can he get an autographed copy of the book that's autographed by both you and Neil? And um, is, is, is there a signing that he can go to, or can he buy one online if there's not a signing in his area? had them available online. There were 500 of them that Neil and I sold, and I'm sorry they sold out in less than 24 hours. Wow. So, Con wow. So Congratulations. Kind of not going to happen. That's it. No more. Because I'm, I'm traveling all over the place and signing books, but I was at Dragon Con last weekend, and 
and uh, I'm at Rose City Comic Con in Portland this weekend and at Salt Lake Comic Con next weekend. So I'm all over the place, which means my autograph's worthless. But um, Neil's Neil's not going to be doing signings with me because he just get totally mobbed. So right. Well, Sorry. well, that's too bad. Disappointing. But but they can get your autograph by going to any of these comic cons that you're going to, um, which I think is good. Yeah. And can they go to well, Word? And and I've got uh, my own website. We have a little bookstore page on it. It's wordfire.com, and there's a little thing called Quick Order, one of the pull down things. And I've got got um, signed Clockwork Lives on there for it's I think it's thirty bucks plus five bucks postage. So right. it's not it's not a big collectible thing i'm just trying to sell some books so right no that's uh, cool what do you do Parker on wordfire.com if somebody orders one off of there can you can they personalize it can they, they say ask that? okay yep. excellent very cool and then um uh jt hockey wanted to know um well he wanted to know what comic cons you're going to be at but i think you just answered that um but you you want to tell people where they can find the schedule of where you'll be um as far as comic cons go well i've got like i said i'm going to be at Portland, Rose City Comic Con this weekend. I, I fly out tomorrow. And then next weekend, I'll be in Salt Lake for the Salt Lake Comic Con. Then over the Halloween weekend, I'll be in LA for Kamikaze, Stan Lee's Kamikaze. Sure. And those oh, are you're, the three. You're doing Kamikaze. That's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, this is our second. We were there the very first year, and, and we loved it. This is just the next time that we got to come around. Uh, and, and this is the embarrassing thing. I've published 130 books and 50 some bestsellers and my website sucks and we're fixing it so uh i i don't quite have the, the calendar of appearances usable yet we're, we're working on it but i also have books to be writing so it's it's on the list of things to do well you got it everybody knows now what was dragon con like dragon con is always my favorite con of the year i well, we just counted this was my 21st dragon con that i've been to i've missed one dragon con in the past 22 years and it's always, it's just this frenetic whirlwind of, of all kinds of fandom. There's cosplay, there's uh, media tie-ins, there's gaming, there is Star Wars and Star Trek and X-Files, and there's a writer's track, and there's comics and role-playing games. It's, it's huge. They keep, they keep spreading out to um, another hotel and another hotel and another hotel that they keep adding on, and each hotel then focuses on this is um, tabletop gaming, and this one is comics, and this one, and they, and it's full of, you know, TV stars and movie stars signing. And I was just walking through the the room, and this is depends on your age, but this is something that kind of geeked me out. Just walking through, and I, I mean, I'm not an autograph collector really, but walking through, and there was there's this table where um, where um, Kier Delay and Gary. I forgot was the the two guys from 2001: A Space Odyssey are wow. just sitting there at a table, just like hi, and and uh, a bunch of the Doctor Who people were there, and and um, True Blood actors, and I mean it's just everything in geekdom is there. Very and cool. It's just great stuff. It, and uh, the extender wanted to know: Do you have a favorite con? Uh, and maybe it is Dragon Con. I don't know. Dragon Con, I think is I. I mean. I do a lot of them, and because we're we're exhibiting and doing panels, I, I'm kind of on the working end of the the con, so I don't go there just for fun because this is my job. Uh, but Dragon Con it sort of is the a little bit of everything for everybody. But you know, we've done so many. The Dallas Fan Expo has been great for us, and Houston um, um, Comic Palooza is great for us, and the Denver Comic Con is great, and um, Emerald City Comic Con up in Seattle. We do like 15 to 18 of them a year. Wow. And we're just, it's our, that's where I sell books and meet fans and sign autographs and, and Wordfire Press, my publishing house, that's where we debut a lot of books. We're debuting two books this weekend in Rose City. We're debuting, I think, four books at uh, Salt Lake. And we have other, like, because I know so many authors, they're my friends. We have other guest authors show up at Salt Lake next weekend at my table, it won't just be me. We've also got Jim Butcher and Larry Correa and Terry Brooks and Ari Salvatore and David Farland and Tracy Hickman. They're all just hanging at our table signing wow. autographs. Very, very cool. We got to get to Portland. That's what we got to do. Well, Portland, Rose City, that's a smaller one. I think maybe it's 40,000, 30 or 40,000. 
Which is hilarious because it used to be a couple of three thousand was a big con. Right. Yeah. Now forty thousand is a small con. But I still I think we it'd be great to get out there and to hang with you and the guys. Um, all right, uh, we got to let you go. Uh, thank you so much for giving us some time. I hope we get you on soon again. Um, I know that the Terrifics love you, and I like you a lot. Uh, we have a great rapport, and you're awesome. I can't wait to read the new book, Clockwork Lives. Uh, show the book one more time. Everybody should go get this book. Look, it's like a Beautiful real. Author. Look at this. The way books are supposed to look. Exactly. They're supposed to look. Got to help get it on the New York Times bestseller list, and I can't wait to read it. I ordered mine just as soon as you showed it to me. I just was like, I got to have that. Um, and I know that G Wiz is going to order one. He already texted me. He's going to get one for his dad, maybe an autograph one. Uh, although he'd love Neil's autograph, I'm sure, because he's a huge Rush fan. Anyway, thank you so much, uh, Kevin. I really appreciate it. And we're going to take a quick break. We'll be back right after this. And of course, we'll have uh, Kevin on again soon. Don't go anywhere. We got more show to come. You're the Terrifics. You make be Terrific special.